Genesis 1-1 does not teach creation out of nothing. Hey everyone, uh, this comment above was left on my recent clip, taken from a full-length episode I did on Genesis and creation. Um, and it is uh, quite common to hear rebuttals such as this. Uh, it is true that most English Bibles will render the first verse of Genesis, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, period. However, we know that this isn't really a great translation for a few reasons. And we know this by looking at the Hebrew itself, uh, as well as the surrounding verses that help build out this construct. So when we look at the Hebrew of Genesis 1-1, the very first word that we read in Hebrew in Genesis 1-1 is bereshit. Uh, now, reshit means beginning, or head of, or first. Um, the preposition at the beginning of the word, uh, made by the addition of the letter bet, indicates that this is in, uh, in beginning, or in the beginning. However, if we were going to render this in the beginning, in absolute terms, we would expect to see uh, the uh, the definite article on that bait, so making it bareshit, or something like that. But that's not what we see. When we read the first word of the Bible, it does not contain the definite article, which we would render in English the, in the beginning. It simply isn't there. Instead, what we have is the letter bait as a preposition on the beginning of the first word, uh, with the two little dots that you'll see here as a shava, indicating that this is not the definite article. So we wouldn't expect to translate this in the beginning in absolute terms. Instead, it would be more accurate to render this in a beginning or in the beginning of something. Or more colloquially in our English today, we would say when, be when God began to create, which is what most newer updated versions of English translations of the Bible render today such as the NRSV, and even the more updated JPS, Jewish Publication Society, Tanakh. So with that in mind, we now have a verse that reads, in the beginning of God creating the heavens and the earth, or rather, when God began to create the heavens and the earth. You see, that's not a complete sentence. In fact, it's just the first part of a clause, a temporal clause, which is only completed by the next couple of verses, verses 2 and 3. And so when we read it in context, we now have when God began to create the heavens and the earth. And now verse two, the earth being unformed and void with darkness over the surface of the deep and a wind from God sweeping over the water. God said, let there be light. And there was light. So most translators today who have been working on this uh, understand the second verse of Genesis one, one through three to be a parenthetical. In other words, this is the background. This is what's happening, the state of affairs that are going on when God decides to create. And so when God decides to create, the earth is already in existence and it is formless. It's void. It has waters, chaotic waters covering it that need to be separated. Hence the separation in verse one of the heavens, the skies and the waters below and the earth. And we have in verse three, the completion of the clause that began in verse one with God said, let there be light. So we can see from the entirety of the first three verses, that the first verse is not a complete sentence, and it is not in absolute terms, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, but rather, in the beginning of when God began to create the earth, this was the state of affairs, and God said, let there be light. So the first creative act that God makes is actually in verse 3. Also, we have to break down what, the, what it means to create in verse 1. The word translated as create in verse 1 comes from the Hebrew word, bara, which unfortunately does not mean to create out of nothing. Uh, it simply means to separate, to cleave, to divide, which is exactly what we see here in the first three verses. God is separating the heavens from the earth. God is separating the waters above from the waters below. God is separating a lot of things in order to divide up the lands, the waters, uh, and to uh, begin the process of bringing life into the world. We also see from the second creation account in Genesis, found in chapters 2 and 3, again, God does not create out of nothing. Rather, he creates as if he's a potter molding clay, uh, molding materials, forming them, and so on. Um, and so we do not find the doctrine of creation ex nihilo anywhere in the first three chapters and two creation accounts in Genesis. So if you'd like to believe that God creates ex nihilo, or out of nothing, unfortunately, you cannot use the first three verses of the Hebrew Bible as a proof text for that position. In fact, I would argue that the entirety of the Bible, both Old and New Testaments, don't really teach creation out of nothing. In fact, when you look at the history, it seems that most of the arguments and discussion that later became the development of the doctrine of creation ex nihilo were settling in around the end of the second century AD. 
And for more information on this, please check out these resources here, including the first view on the, Do the Doctrine of Creation Ex Nihilo and its history and development, as well as this one here by Dr. Holmstead on the syntax of Genesis 1, 1 through 3. And I would also like to include in that list this resource here. This is The Lost World of Genesis 1 by John Walton, which is a fantastic book breaking down the worldview of the early Israelite people and how they understood their own creation accounts.